Hi. <laughs> My name is Marley Trigg Stewart. I'm the coordinator for public programs here at ICP. And I want to welcome you guys here for a very special live taping of the Black Shatter podcast hosted by Idris Talib Solomon and Andre Wagner. Um, yes. We love some interim applause. Um, tonight, we're going to get a look inside Andre's process as he's photographed his community, his new show at the Gordon Parks Foundation, and his recent collaboration with the We Heart NYC campaign. Uh, before we begin, I want to start by acknowledging that we are currently on unceded Lenape and intertribal land, and that as we're thinking about the politics of visibility, as we often do at ICP, we must remind ourselves of the histories and colonial presence that are rendered invisible today. As you saw in our opening credits, ICP's school and galleries are open. Make sure to check out our online and in-person in course offerings and workshops for teens. Uh, further information on all of our offerings can be found by visiting our website at icp.org. The galleries are open until 9 p.m. tonight, and we have three shows on view through January 8th. Immersion, Gregory Halpern, Vasanthi Yogananthan, and Raymond Meeks, Muriel Hasbun, Tracing Torunio, and Play the Part, Marlena Dietrich. We've got a lot of fun events and stimulating conversations planned for the fall, so make sure to check that out at icp.org slash events. Um, so let's just get into tonight's speakers. Um, Idris Talib Solomon is a native of Brooklyn, using the camera to illuminate the extraordinary treasures nestled within black communities. It is his aim to share the profound narratives, vibrant cultures, and the beauty that grace their everyday lives. As a multimedia storyteller, he aspires to forge meaningful bonds, drawing inspiration from his experiences in advertising, marketing, photography, and podcasting, he brings a distinct perspective to the realm of creative problem solving. His journey into the world of podcasting initiated as a humble listener, eventually evolving into the creation of his own enchantments with the Black Shutter podcast. This platform stands as a tribute to the remarkable contributions made by black photographers. Each podcast, with its distinctive audience, has bestowed blessings upon him, allowing the convergence of ideas with those who yearn to hear from them. He firmly holds that storytelling is an influential form of communication with no definitive right or wrong way to convey narrative. The essence lies in the connection it forges. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Idris. Thank you. All right, thank you, Molly. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody. Thank y'all for coming through to Late Night ICP. My name is Idris Talib Solomon and I'm the host of the Black Shutter Podcast. And tonight we have the homie Andre Wagner with us, man. So we're going to try to, you know, get into a little bit behind Andre's story and some of the inspiration behind the work that he makes. So, um, you know, I'm just going to read off a brief bio for Andre. So Andre Wagner is a photographer and artist living and working in Brooklyn, New York. He explores and chronicles the poetic and lyrical nuances of daily life using the city particularly his own neighborhood and community as his subjects. His work and practice fits into the lineage of street photography that investigates the American social landscape, often focusing his lens on themes of race, class, and cultural identity. His work has been seen in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Time, Vogue, and several other publications. He also photographed the key art and campaign photography for Queen and Slim. Andre is the 2022 Gordon Parks Fellow, and welcome to the Black Shutter tonight, man. How you feeling out there, bro? I'm feeling great. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for being here. Indeed, indeed. So, Andre, you are from Omaha, Nebraska, right? So, uh, tell us, how did your environment growing up out there, like, influence how you see the world? Yeah, I'm, I mean, growing up in Omaha, we were just kind of chatting about Omaha before we started, and I was just telling you about the black community in South Omaha, where I grew up. And, you know, as a kid, it's like your neighborhood, your community is like your whole world. It was a, a safe place to grow up as a kid. You know, I played a lot of sports. I played basketball growing up, um, had very hardworking parents, you know, my and just like a beautiful community. And so, you know, just kind of like any kid kind of growing up in the Midwest, like that was kind of, I kind of had like your typical like upbringing. So I think, you know, just having 
parents and community members that were just, you know, uplifting and, you know, con- inspiring you to go after, you know, what it is that, that makes you excited. And so, like, that's that's kind of how I grew up. And, you know, I was always an athlete, but I also always had this, like, artistic inclinations. You know, I, I would like to draw. I love painting classes and things like that. And so it just wasn't really later until, like, really graduating college until I, I, I got into photography and started to think about, you know, photography and art in, like, a serious way. So, you know, um, you said something about um, something about a typical community supporting supporting you, right? And the interesting thing about um, this podcast and, and being able to speak to so many different photographers over the last few years is that um, not everybody's uh, upbringing is the same, right? And a lot of people feel like, you know, that based on images they see about black people on TV and in the media that um, photography, it, like getting gear is a struggle for every black person, right? Because of the cost of entry, right? Um, or that the parents don't always su- uh, support, like a lot of um, f- um, children of immigrants don't always get the support from their parents, right? But you're, in your situation, it sounds like not only your parents, but your community supported you, right? So um, what was life like in your home with your parents and in, in, in the arts? I mean, you know, they, my parents just like encouraged me. Like they, I, it's, I, I wasn't really into the arts as a kid. Like I did it, but like nobody really, it was kind of like my own little private thing off to the side. And like maybe some teachers kind of knew about it. But, you know, my parents just, like, encouraged me playing basketball, playing summer AAU. And I think, you know, also just kind of just seeing them, how they live their life and just what their aspirations were for me, which was, like, you're going to college, you're going to college. My mom had me at the early age of, like, 18, you know. And so my parents were, like, they were young parents, and they just wanted to, they just wanted to like, set me up for something that they didn't have. So their whole thing was just, like, you're going to college, you know. And so I always kind of had my mindset on that. And I think, um, you know, looking back at it now, you know, I, I grew up around, you know, lower to middle class um, black folk kind of community. And it, I think there's just like a lot of beauty in, in how we find ways to live and to, to make ends meet and to be in community with our brothers and sisters or whatever. And so I think just having those early kind of memories of just like what it looks like to persevere or make things happen even when money's tight or you know even my parents just encouraging me to do things that they didn't have the opportunities to do I think these are just things that instill like it instills something in me that I can like go after what it is I want in life even though I didn't know what that was like in the moment like in in those moments it was just trying to be a basketball player trying to go to college and play basketball but like Even in my community, like, you know, we had a lot of really great athletes and like, you know, being in Omaha, you're still surrounded around a lot of things that you kind of see in other big cities, just maybe in a a smaller, more minute way. But, you know, I grew up around drugs, guns, you know, teenage pregnancies, like, and these are all things that my friends, you know, kind of got involved with in some way or another. And I remember even me just like going to like a small D3 college was like, a huge thing in my community and in my family because like a lot of my friends didn't go to college like they didn't kind of stay back home and just start working or go into the army it wasn't a lot of people like leaving the community and going to college and so it was kind of tough in in the beginning because it's like you come back on like those holidays and it's like oh college boy think you too good for this think you too good for that but just being in a university environment even though I was in like Storm Lake, Iowa, which was like an all-white community and so far from like anything that I had really um, been around, it still opened up my world to just more possibilities, meeting different types of people, meeting international students. It just continued to just broaden like what I know is out there. And so, you know, I guess I'm grateful for just like having those opportunities and having like, you know, parents that push me and, and really try to provide something for me because that just kind of gave me room to play and figure out what that could be. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I grew up in a situ in a in a similar situation. I think my mother, at heart, was an artist, but she had no support. She didn't have like any guidance on how she can kind of pursue a career in art. And even today, a, a lot of artists find challenges in, you know, um, being able to pursue their art. Right. 
So I, I think my mother did her best to make sure, like, if I needed supplies to draw, to sketch or color, you know, she would bring home stacks of paper from her office, like the printing paper, and I'd get the three hole punches, and that would kind of be like my, my sketchbook, you know. So um, I definitely understand, you know, what your parents did to kind of support your art. Um, so when you went to school, understand that you, you pursued social work, right? So one thing that I always find interesting when I speak to photographers is, you know, the, the people who have an outside interest or an outside talent before they pick up a camera and they, they kind of merge that outside talent with their photography, they start to create a very unique style of photography because their interests are their interest and that's gonna influence their style, right? So I wonder if you can tell us how your, your experience or your education in social work shows up in the, the images that you make. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point just because like, you know, I went to school as a social worker. I worked as a social worker. I did work as a, in the juvenile court in high schools. Um, I worked with kids with physical and mental disabilities and, you know, you enter into people's homes. And once you kind of get that intimate with people, it just gives you like a whole kind of other side of just like what people go through. And I think it, it expands like your own sense of like what humanity is and like how you can kind of like meet people where they are, how you can make people feel seen and feel comfortable around you. You know, I was like in a place to to try to help people out. And so, um, and then I think also being an athlete is something that influenced my photography as well. Cause like first I have like, you know, the social work kind of like mindset or, or um, just kind of like understanding of the human condition. And then I also have um, this kind of like dedication and practice and, energy of like an athlete to like move my body and just be physical and so to like kind of like merge those things into like an art form like street photography like I could have never imagined that coming together like that but I'm so I guess grateful for my path because I think that's what makes my work like you're saying my work mine and you know it's what kind of gives me the entry points to like how it is that I want to go out and, and make work and and kind of like enter people's lives and be in communities. Um, like I remember when I moved to Bushwick in 2012, like when I first started documenting my neighborhood, one of the first things I asked myself is like, what's my responsibilities, you know, to these people and to this neighborhood? Like, I didn't know anything about Bushwick at a time. You know, I didn't know it was on the verge of like all of this change, but I think coming to it with this question and, and kind of opening myself up and and also just just understanding that there's there's just, there's more to just going out and making photographs but it's like you you kind of have like a responsibility um in a way that you want to picture a place in a way that you want to like move and navigate that place i think just asking those questions early on gave me like the fortitude and kind of like the openness to then go out and see like what that meant for me, you know? And so I think those things kind of just shape how you go out in, into the world or into like the, you know, people's lives and, and make work. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of like how a lot of that really kind of infuses itself with my work. I mean, I, th I think it shows, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the images in the slideshow right now and I, I feel like, you know, when I discovered that you were pursuing, that you pursued a, a degree in social work and I look at your work after that fact, I'm like, yeah, it's pretty clear, right? And I think that um, your photography is such an interesting craft because essentially the camera is just the tool we are using to document a specific moment in time. And that moment in time is something defined by how we see the world, right? So your perspective coming from Omaha, like a, a black town out there, coming to um, Bushwick, one of the black neighborhoods in New York, you know, you have the mindset and the perspective of looking at black culture, but then you also have like the academic side and the um, sociological side of the you know, social work that you do that's allowing you to make work that is not just a photograph, but it's also just like a snapshot of what's happening in these communities, man. So I think that's, um, I think that's really evident in the work that you're, you're making. Um, you know, Black Shutter was, created during the time where it was a lot of frustration. You know, a lot of my um, colleagues, black photographers were just really frustrated. Um, and there was just so many challenges that we were up against. And 
it came at a time when it was like, instead of being upset and angry about what's going on in the industry, uh, let's channel it into something that could be a little constructive, right? Um, so with that said, you know, ev every stage of this journey, right, there are challenges and hurdles. Um, for you right now, at the particular stage that you're in, in your career, what are some of the, you know, hurdles or challenges that you see either for yourself or that you see for like, um, you know, young black photographers coming up? I mean, I guess so. Like I've been, I've been in New York for like 13 years now, been pretty much photographing ever since I moved here. And so even just like in my time span of just like, even when I got started in like 2011, 2012, like. I remember, you know, when I started finding myself on the street and being interested in street photography, you know, first thing you do is you kind of look and like, all right, what black street photographers are out there? And, and at the time, you really couldn't find nothing. Like, obviously, Gordon Parks was coming up, but I've, I've, I've seen things change in this, like, small, like, 12, 13-year time period because, like, I remember it was even, like, it was hard to find information about, like, Roy DiCarava or Kamongi. Um, you know, Carrie Mae Weems, like, I don't know. I've seen, like, some of the conversations or at least the visibility of black f photographers kind of shift in a beautiful way. Um, and so it's also kind of cool to see, like, I don't know, where I'm, like, I, I feel like I'm, like, in between these generations, like, where I'm seeing, like, younger photographers kind of come up and, like, have, like, a whole new, like, landscape of kind of, like, photography to, like, deal with, you know, and so, like, it's also just beautiful to see things shift and there just be more accessibility of all kinds of work and all kinds of stories. But I think, um, I mean, anybody trying to carve out a life in the arts is, is going to be difficult, you know, on multiple fronts, whether it's like, like you're saying, your entry level to equipment, you know, or to dark rooms or to printing, um, to get education, to, to have critical thought. And so, you know... I don't know. I think for me, it was like I always like was interested in books, and I use a lot of books to kind of help educate me, you know. But I think you photo just photo books, photo books, the internet, um, you know, lectures, like whatever it is. And, and but I don't know. It's also just I don't know. There's a, there's a beautiful community that's always kind of like been around of photographers that's just like making work in communities that you can find yourself in. I think. I had a lot of those early frustrations of just like living in New York, trying to make enough money to pay rent or whatever, trying to get opportunities, you know, to to do assignments and, and things like that, um, or to like show my work in galleries. Like, and I think, I don't know, over the year, I, was like, I guess I've just learned to be patient. I've learned to just kind of like to stay the course. And, you know, um, I've had like, certain opportunities or breaks that's helped me out. Like I remember I think in twenty fifteen I got into the New York Times portfolio review and I I think I applied like two or three times before I got in. But when I got into that, that's how I started working with the New York Times and that's how I started working with other publications. And so it's just been this th this gradual thing. I think just being persistent, continuing to like always make your work, no matter if nobody's looking or if you're not getting hired, I think you know, as a photographer, you gotta build your own voice and you gotta you gotta make the work. And so, you know, just keeping your head down and, and working and then just trying to piece it together, you know, any way that you can. But I mean it, it definitely hasn't been easy. Um but it's also been beautiful. Like I remember when I first moved here in twenty eleven, I was living in graduate school housing and I was living on fifty eighth street, right across from Central Park, and I was like Super broke, and I remember like a friend gave me uh, Voices in a Mirror, and that's how I started reading about Gordon Parks and knowing about his work, you know. So then, fast forward to 2022 and being at Cipriani at the Gordon Parks Foundation Gala, you know, talking about being a, a fellow, like it was a, a full cir circle moment, but it also just showed me like how important it is to stay true to your voice and to like what that you feel is like burning inside of you and just going after that because, like think anything worth having is going to take time and is there's going to be a push and pull, you know, but it's just like staying persistent. So, all right. So I love this part of the conversation, right? Because, you know, um, we learned that, you know, you're from Omaha, Nebraska. You grew up in a, you know, a, a black town out there. Um, arts was around, sports was around. Um, your parents pushed you to go to college. 
went away to college, right? Studied social work. And then fast forward 2022, you're a Gordon Parks fellow. But there's a lot of gaps in there, right? There's a lot of gaps in that story that I, I want to help uncover, right? So um, where were you when you first picked up a camera? Like at what point did like photography enter your life? <laughs> My freshman year of undergrad, I was signing up for classes. I was really just trying to play basketball. So I was like, what easy classes can I sign up for? And I signed up for like a black and white one oh you know, one oh one class. And so like that was like my first introduction to photography. And it was it was black and white class. You know, you have to shoot film, make pictures, you know. But at the time, like I was not into photography at all. You know, I would turn my pictures in and they would be purple because I'm not fixing them long enough. Like I don't really want to be in the dark room. And so it wasn't until you know, I came to New York, was doing grad school, and I, I mean, basketball kind of ended for me where I just had this void in my life, and that's when I picked up the camera again, and what I had was like a Nikon F because that's what I had from that class, and, and then I find myself in New York, and then I started learning about serious photography and going to galleries, and then like, I also fell in love with black and white silver prints, so that I was just like, everything kind of like came back in a, in a way, and I was like, well, I do have this portfolio from my freshman year of college. It tells me how to develop film and this and that. And I'm falling in love with this photography. So I, I just kind of like, that was like, I guess like when I jumped into it, but like from a whole different kind of perspective and never really saw it coming back around, but I'm, I'm glad I signed up for that class for sure. I mean, I had a similar story. Um, you know, I signed up for a black and white photography class. I took two classes and then some of my gear got stolen. And then I didn't pick up a camera again for like, eight years or whatever. And when I did pick it up again, it was like that first click was like, ah, there's something very familiar about this. And I, I just kept going as well. But um, so for, and I'm sure, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a few photographers in the building, right? Um, I know like at a certain point in our journey, we're making bad work, right? A lot of bad work. But then there's a moment where we look at an image and we're like, this image just leveled up. And it's one of those validating type of images, right? Um, when did you start to feel validated? When did you start to look at your work and say, all right, there's something clicking here. I'm, I'm getting this. This is my, my vision coming to life in these, these prints. Like, when did that happen for you? Yeah, I remember like, I feel like 2013, you know, where I was really starting to get serious about street photography and I was just out all the time shooting. And I would come home and I would develop my film and I start scanning stuff and I would always just feel like my pictures aren't quite, th I always be like, I would be looking at photos and like, oh, if I would have got a little bit closer or if I would have waited a second, like, I just felt like I was kind of like half-assing it in a way. Like, I knew the picture I wanted to get, but I wasn't quite making the photograph that I felt like I was capable of. And I think you just, I think any photographer, you know, gets to a point to where they're just like, I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go out here and shoot film and, and spend all this time and this energy. I'm like, just leave it all out there. And like that goes back to like that athlete mentality, just like leave it all out on the court. You know what I mean? And so, um, and then it's also, you're, you're bouncing off your work from other other good work and like I used to go to the ICP in Midtown all the time like midday and hop in the library and I'm looking at Gary Winogram books or whatever and I'm you know I'm looking at this great work and I'm like okay like my work's not standing up to this and I think you, it just gets to a point where it's just like okay you gotta try to push harder you gotta you gotta really like push yourself I had to push myself to make the images that I felt like I was capable of and it just, it just took time but it took me to be really serious with like how serious I'm being about being about this, and 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 what I feel like I'm capable of, and being just like, are you are you really going out there and just making those images? And I think slowly but surely, I started to get more comfortable. I started to be like a little bit more bold. I started to, you know, feel more assurance and confidence in what I was going after, you know. And I think little by little, like the the work just continues to get better but I think you I just had to really dig deep and be like okay like if I'm gonna do this like I really gotta do it so you know I saw a few um interviews video interviews of you like out on the street making work and you know you're walking 
and just like holding up your camera and just snapping. You're not even like missing the beat. You're not even like hesitating. And for me, I was like, wow, this dude is super dialed in on his, you know, his technical game is good, right? Because you got to know what settings to have your camera at um, in order to get that moment. But it's also, um, there's a boldness, like you said, there's a boldness in how you're approaching street photography that I feel like um, a lot of people don't understand or don't, haven't developed that skill. And, you know, there is, you know, do you, you, It's, it's, I think that's where the social work aspect comes in also because there are people who can be bold, photographers that could be bold, but also intrusive, right? And there's a way that you're approaching the people that you photograph in a way that's like, I'm going to go get this photo because I know I'm doing it respectfully as opposed to I'm going to get this photo and I'm doing it voyeuristically, you know what I mean? So um, I think it's really dope that you, you know, you bring that social work aspect into your work. Um, I know that, you know, this is a mantra that uh, you live by, right? It's, um, it's always on time or it's always right now, mm -hmm. right? Uh, tell us why that mantra is so important to you. I mean, I think that's all there is. You know, you talk about going out into the world and making photographs and like, you know, going back to that, like pushing myself or just trying to be serious about what I'm doing. You know, sometimes it's like you'll be on the streets and or say a subway is great. You'll you'll be on the subway, you'll be sitting there, and this beautiful scene is happening. And you'll be like, okay, I'll take the picture at the next stop, and then boom, they get off the subway. You know what I mean? And it's like it's always right now. Like all we have is like right now. There is like no. I'm gonna come back tomorrow and try to get it. It's like just trying to. I think it's always right now. Just grounds me into just being very present. You know what I mean? It's almost like a like a meditation or like a Zen practice. It's like, let me put my phone away. It's on do not disturb. I want to be alive and present for what's in front of me, you know, because I feel like it, it. it is like, you know, photography can feel very jarring, you know, it's the way that I practice it, where people are just living their lives, going to school, going to work, hanging out with friends, and here comes this photographer snapping pictures. And so like, I feel like I have to ground myself to give, put myself in the game so that like, I have the energy to talk to people, to hop in conversations, to, to be smart, to, to, to just like bring a certain presence. So if I do kind of come in and I'm like interrupting something or I'm just there, at least like that energy I'm bringing is, is like, I'm not like nervous or timid or whatever. Like I'm convinced that like this is what's happening. You know, and I think that rubs off like just on people around you, that rubs off on your own psyche. And I think, I don't know, for me, it's like that at least allows me the comfort of knowing that like I'm putting all of me into like what I'm doing and I'm not being distracted. And, and I don't know, I think just going back to like that seriousness, like it's it's hard to make really great photographs. It's hard to you know, especially if you're talking about street photography where everything's in flux, everything, you know, nobody is there for you. And so I feel like I have to kind of like enter it in that kind of way to kind of be tapped into that sixth sense so you can see things start to happen on the street so you can understand like if you need to walk a little bit faster or slow down or if you should make that right turn or left turn. I don't know. It's just trying to be tapped into like all the sensitivities that we have as like human beings. Um, yeah, and that's just like how I like to work. So, you know, I've taught a few like intro photo classes to, you know, wide range of, of students. Some who are interested in photography, some who like their job sent them to like, you know, take this class because they needed to use their phones out in the field or whatever. And one of the first things I told them, like the, the students would sit down and take their cameras out and they're like all flexing. And I'm like, all right, cool, put your cameras away. We're all gonna go outside and take a walk. And I, the whole purpose for that was I wanted to un, I wanted them to understand that photography starts before you have the camera. And I said, let's walk around and like visually take pictures with your mind, right? Like look at interesting things happening. Look at lighting. Look at how like a couple is engaging, right? Look at how like are these two people 
Are they uh, laughing? Are they about to fight? Are they friends? Are they strangers? Pay attention to all these details happening around you. And, and my, I, I call it photo stacking, right? Where it's like I, I, I pay attention to my surroundings as I go through my day. And I look at these these different scenes unfolding. And I'm like, okay, cool. That's a scene I'm going to look for next time when I have my camera. I'm, I'm going to be aware of the type of lighting in this situation. Um, and that's for me, it feels like that's a way of like being present when I'm just like walking around so that when I do have my camera, I'm just like, all right, cool. I've, I've paid attention to some of these things that are, are interesting to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So I know that you have a 100% like wet dark room, right? <laughs> um, you're doing, you're, you're 100% committed to film, right? Why film? I mean, I think it, I just, I like working with my hands. It goes back to, yeah, I fell in love with silver prints, you know. Um, I learned how to make prints early on before I realized that's what I wanted to do. And I just wanted to like be in the same world of like all of these amazing photographers that I love, you know. And like, I just, you know, looking at like Eugene Smith's prints or Roy DiCarava, you know, um, photographers who also like Deanne Arbus photographers also kind of like really had their hand in it and I I just feel like there's just like another element that's being brought to the work in that kind of way and that's just how I personally like that's what makes me excited is like living with my work dealing with it on both ends of it understanding like the aesthetic that I that I want to create and and kind of being the master of that um, like I can go in the dark room anytime I want and, and whip up a print. I don't have to, you know, deal with like a lab and like there are a hundred clients and their timelines and stuff. And so I also I'm kind of like a control freak. I just like to have the control and, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's, that's just why it's just, it feels like that's what makes me tick. You know, they say like the photograph, especially with film, the photograph uh, starts after you press the shutter. Right, so it's like now you got the negative, right, and you you develop that, and then the dark room is a whole other process of like mastering like printing in the dark room. So um, it sounds like you want to have your hands on the the creative side, like the the creation of the image, the initial image, and then how it's put out into the world as well. Yeah, and I think you know Roy was one of those people who talked about it. It starts before you snap the shutter, and like I think. Roy DiGarava was such a, a pioneer in that regard in which like clearly like you understand like the, what he's interested in through his subject matter which is like black life in Harlem you know but then it's like he also had a, a, a very particular vision in like how he articulated that with light and with shadow play and like how deep he can go in like the, the dark tones and stuff like that and I just like that kind of full circle kind of view of making images where it's like you're kind of you want to see it all the way through and like I don't know if any of you all have been to like a show and saw Roy DiGarava's prints but like I rem he had a show at the David Zwarner a, a few years ago and it's like David Zwarner is this big gallery with ceilings like this and you know Roy DiGarava has these small 11 by 14 prints and they're it you feel so you feel a bodily emotion like going through that gallery and looking at that work. And I think it just speaks volumes, you know what I mean? Especially in like the world we live in today, you know, where these small little prints can still just hold up in this world of like now everything's like kind of bigger than life, you know? And it's like, there's any, you can do it whichever way you want to do it. But I think it just, what I'm trying to say is that like, it's clearly his vision, like, seeing it all the way through and it's, it's it works like <laughs> the work is powerful and it stands the test of time and so I don't know it's just like you just kind of just takes these lessons from the masters and just try to like do it your own way that feels like true to you does the do, do you ever lose the magic of seeing like a print come to life when you drop it into the to the developer no but I'm not so like romantic about the dark room because once you it's real work like it's you know I don't if anybody's worked in the dark room you know like it's it's real labor um but it is it's still magical and it's beautiful to like you know you go out there and you make these photographs and then it's like you develop the film and you make this print that you can see and hold and 
Like it is powerful. Give it away. And give it away, you know. Um and so yeah, I mean that's just the magic of photography. Like it's just like it's just a beautiful medium. And I, I that's just the way that I like to practice it in just kind of like the traditional form. But like, I don't know. At the end of the day, it's like the work has to speak to people, no matter which way, whether it's digital film, silver gelatin, or inkjet, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about, like, expression, and everybody's just kind of, like, finding their way to, to kind of be honest. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, I want to go into um, a few of your images, right, that um, are on display at the um, Gordon Parks Foundation. And uh, hopefully we just have like a quick conversation about some of these. Um, I know this image was not, I don't think this is part of the... Um, no, this is the... This um, is part of the, um, the, the We Heart New York, right? But um, I did want to speak about these, this one and uh, this image, right? So these are portraits, like straight up portraits. Um, you're set up in the, in, the, in the subway station right downstairs. Um, and this is a little bit different from um, the work that you... You know, we've been watching on the slideshow because these are intentional portraits. How do you um, approach making portraits versus doing your street photography? Yeah, I mean, whether it's a it's a street photograph and like all these things in flux, or it's a a, a portrait where I'm in conversation with somebody, I think I'm always trying to like uncover something that's like a little bit hidden, you know. It's trying to just like kind of get beneath the layers, and so with, with portraiture, it's just like you want to you want to try to get you know your the pers your subject matter to kind of like reveal something you know about themselves, um, maybe something that they don't even notice, or it, it could be through an expression, you know, it can be through a glance. Um, I mean, this woman is she's beautiful with all her jewelry. Um, with this American flag scarf, you know, um, but then I don't know, to me, like, maybe there's, like, there's just even something so endearing about her eyes, you know, and, like, even go back to the other portrait where, you know, this kid's on graduation day, and he's kind of throwing up, like, the peace sign, and, but I don't know, there's just something about the pride in that smile, you know, that just feels so genuine, I love like the little bit of motion in the background. It just kind of adds to like the energy. And so I don't know, with portraiture, it's just just like with anything I'm trying to do is like I said, it's just trying to like get below the layers of like whatever it is. So there's like multiple things that you can kind of like dig into. It's also interesting that this young man is he's in a cap and gown and he's on the train by himself. But still like super happy, right? And super excited. And that to me is like I don't really see that. Usually, cap and gown, you're with like somebody. You're with a parent, you're with some, or you're with your crew, and they all got their cap and gown on too, but he's by himself. I think that's a very interesting um, image as well. Um, so, you know, you, you photograph, your photographs document New York in a very particular way, right? Um, what do you see in people that, you know, makes you interested in photographing them? I mean, I think it can be anything. Like here, it's like I'm clearly into like this movement. The, the movement just feels like it's expressive. You know, this is a photograph from my window. This kid is a uh, kid who used to live across the street. And so I think there's, you know, there's many things. Like sometimes it, it can just be the simple like energy. Like like this feels like energy to me. So like sometimes people just have like a certain energy. Um, sometimes it could be, like I said, like a glance, um, the way somebody looks and how that might be juxtaposed with something that's next to them. And they don't really even realize like how that just creates a different kind of narrative just based on how the photographer wants to frame it. And so I try to leave myself really open and, I, and that's why it goes back to like, it's always right now. And I try to go back to being centered because I think if I don't know, sometimes I think if we think we know too much or we know what we're going to go after and get or what we want, you kind of close yourself off to something that might kind of be surprising. And I think, yeah, I don't know, there's something about just being open that keeps you 
not feeling like you know too much. And, that, you know, because I think, I don't know, a lot of times we, we there could be a lot of cliches, but a photograph that could be a cliche, a cliche could turn into something different, like that kid throwing up the peace sign. Like, we just say, like, oh, I got this picture of this kid throwing up a peace sign. It sounds like, it's like, okay, like, we all see that. But then hopefully when you see that photograph, like, something else is kind of, like, is, is expressed or something else comes through. And so... I just try to stay open and be informed by like what I'm responding to, like whatever it makes me go like, ooh, or like look that way or like the way the light might hit something. It's like all of that to me is like could be photographic material because at the end of the day, it's really about perception. Like the photographs, you know, they're silent. They, they can't speak. They're mute. They're flat. And it's like as we look at an image, as we dissect it, it's your perception that basically gives it meaning so if you're not really tapped in to like yourself and what's happening on the world out on the outside world and what might be photographic you know you kind of might be blocking yourself and so I try to stay really open to like what makes me feel anything just on a human level because then that might be able to be something that's turned into like some type of emotionality in a photograph and the interesting thing about that is Again, the camera is a tool to document how we see the world. So when we put an image out into the world and people vibe with it, people resonate with it, that means that the more we tap into ourselves and share the parts of the world that we're experiencing, the more we're just sharing ourselves. You know, sort of like some inception type stuff. Yeah, I mean, I feel like all my street photographs are basically self-portraits. You know, I think they, they, they're multiple layer. Like, yeah, it might be a photograph like, of this community of or of this person but a lot of times there's something that I see reflected and it's also a self-portrait and so like it is it's like you you are like kind of like giving yourself in that kind of way yeah so I remember hearing this piece of advice um from a photo instructor and he said it was in, in regards to composition like making stronger composed images and said so think of the composition as like the noun right you you see a you see a uh, interesting environment, and you you plant your feet, and that's the noun. And then you sort of wait for the verb to happen, right? So that's when like a person walks into your frame, or like these kids, you could like look out the window and say, okay, I like the way the cars are positioned, the lighting looks great. And then you can kind of wait for the verb for these kids to run through. Um, but in your work, so that's something that like really stuck with me. Um, in your work and after, and seeing some videos of how you work and it's so fast, right? Like, do you stop, do you consider composition when you're making your images um, or is it really focused more on the moment? Like, is it like a blend of the two? I mean, it's, it's definitely both. It's like, I think I try to work with the same camera, same lens all the time. So the composition just becomes like second nature. It's just like the way you see, yeah. you know? And so... You know, I have to get so caught up on composition, you can get into like the moment or when these things are going to happen. And so, yeah, I try to keep it real simple. Like I don't like switch things up too much, you know, because then that gives me the freedom to like work within that. So, you know, street photography, I, I know a lot of people want to pursue street photography, um, but I feel like there's at least in the beginning, there's something missing from the images. You were mentioning earlier that um, you needed to get closer, right? Like, you, um, and it, I forget which photographer said, if your images aren't good, that means you're not close enough, right? You got to get closer. Um, and what I what was really amazing about your work is how close you are able to get, especially in um, these communities that have been, you know, vulnerable to photography, like. You know, um, people parachuting into our communities and only photographing like the poverty and, and the pain and the struggles. Um, a lot of our communities don't always, they're not always receptive to, to people with cameras. And you're able to be in this community and get close and get the people in these, in these genuine moments. Um, like what is it about your personality and how you approach people um, that gives you access to document these genuine moments? I don't, I don't know. I was like, I got to be like a, a doctor to figure that out. I, I mean, I just try to be me. I'm open. You know, I like people. You know, I try, you know, I share what I'm doing. I'm not, 
it's not like I'm what I'm trying to do in, is in secret. And like I said, I think it also goes back to like the energy that you put out. Um, you know, photographing in my neighborhood, it's like I kind of hang around the same spot. So I'm I'm always like kicking it with the same vendors or I'm in the same area. And then there starts to be a familiarity with you. Um, you start to kind of blend into the fabric of the place. Like when I'm in Bushwick and like my neighborhood, Gates Avenue and stuff, I'm kind of operating very differently than if I'm in like Midtown, you know. And so I think the way a photographer work also shifts based on like where you are, you know. And so... Um, but yeah, that, that getting close thing, it's like, you know, uh, sometimes like here, like I'm, I'm, I remember I was in Harlem and I was like talking to these kids, you know how kids are, they're rowdy after school, 2.30 hits and it's like the kids just got out clearly and like sometimes it's just a matter of just like jumping in conversations and, and chatting with folks and sometimes people are having it and sometimes they're not and like that's cool too. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just try to like, I don't know, present myself as honest as can be. And and just try to have conviction about like what it is that I'm doing, you know. I mean, I see the one kid putting up the the deuces and the, and the other kid flipping the bird. And I have I look back at a lot of pictures when I was younger, and I was definitely the kid flipping the bird. So it's just um, like classic childhood, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like it's just like <laughs> they probably wouldn't do that if their parents is around, but they just with the homies kicking it, you know. So. Um, like I remember this photograph, like this is like a, one of those like long summer days and I was walking home, I'm in Best Eye and I was waiting at the bus stop and it was like a group of like five kids and um, I was just like kind of chatting with them. They were asking me about my camera and I ended up making this portrait of like of these two kids and I, you know, it's just kind of representative of that young summertime love, you know, the way that they, just the body language, you know, also their gaze just feels so genuine. And like clearly like that happened because like we were sitting there kind of like rapping and and then this moment happened. And then it's like also just being I'm I don't know, just I, when I look at this photograph, I like right now I'm thinking about like my influences and like I think about like Dawood Bay's like amazing like street um portraiture, you know, and like I can see the influence of just like the works that I've studied as well. And so it's like you're a student as like as a photographer I think you're always a student cuz like there's just so much great work and great photographers that there's just made stuff that you can like look at and um try to just like hit these hit these marks that people just really love and feel and the work of the greats leaves a fingerprint on our work you know whether we are aware of it or not you know yeah, this this photograph is like right across the street from where I used to live, and this is kind of like one of those early moments that just kind of taught me to always have my camera, because like I think this was like in the morning, and I was just going to the bodega to, you know, get a bacon, egg, and cheese and some coffee, and like this beautiful scene just kind of appeared, and like I just thought the shadow was beautiful, the way the girl looks back, and I don't know, just like you know this family like in the neighborhood, and I'm just like. Yeah, you just never know. Like, it could be simple as going to the bodega and you might just see something really beautiful. And so, like, I just, early on, I was just like, okay, I just want to kind of have my camera all the time. So, do you have your camera with you all the time? Still, yes. Because yeah. <laughs> it's always right now, you know what I mean? And it's like, I don't know. A lot of the photographs aren't always, like, great or impressive or you know, whatever, but like sometimes these other like little in-between moments that you might photograph or things that you might not think twice about might kind of like give you some ideas about something that you might want to continue to explore. You might just, you know, there could be an accident kind of happening, you know, with that kind of just like having your camera all the time. But um, like this, I, again, like a, in my neighborhood, I was just hanging out with these kids, probably like playing tag or whatever. And we, they all like lined up to take like a proper like picture, and this kid Denim just like ran up and like jumped in front of my lens, and it's like, you know, that's a moment that I I couldn't have created the, mm -hmm. I you know that just happened, and it just happened to be like really beautiful and again expressive. Is there a kid behind his head that's that's being blocked? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's like what two kids like heads that you can hardly see. And then that's Cedric on the left, uh, you know, the kid that I've been photographing for almost like 10 years now. Yeah, I definitely want to hear more about how you um, established this um, 
you know, uh, friendship with Cedric. I have some. This um, this image, sorry, yeah, you off. Yeah, no, nah, this was like really an important image. I think I made this in 2014, and I was um, I was with a homie actually, and we we were eating the best eye um, fish fry, and I remember afterwards we walking back to my crib. And I saw these, I saw these brothers like riding their bike down the the street. And I, as soon as I saw that they were like turning towards us, I ran out in the middle of the street with my camera, and took two pictures. This was the first one I took. Um, and the way the composition came together with the train in the background, and it just kind of like these like leading lines. But then I was also just thinking about like you know you got the scaffolding, and I, I was just thinking about like how the train is like this like pillar that kind of just like sets you in a place like it, it's it's almost the train has so much it's so expressive in its own way you know and i was like oh like i love photographing on broadway and like i just started thinking about like kind of the environment more and like photographing the environment and like having the train being part of photographs so you can kind of get a sense like of the place and then like that's also something that I got from other photographers. Like one of my favorite photographers is Chris Killup and it's a London photographer and he photographed in Wales, like on the sea coal town. And just like the ships and stuff that he would photograph, just like how they just gave you a sense of the environment. I thought the trains could kind of be representative of the way the ships were representative in his work. Absolutely, and and being from Brooklyn, I see these, I see the elevated trains, and I automatically feel like I know where, or I don't, I know the vicinity of where this is at, and then in a lot of your work, I know exactly where that is. Like I walked, I probably walked by there this morning. You know what I mean? Um, so like I, I, I definitely see the train as that grounding presence, and to see it in images means that, especially like repeatedly in your images means like this photographer is embedded in this community that for a long time people didn't go and visit, you know what I mean? Yeah, and you it's just like trying to find ways to give the photographs like just more things, like just more meat, you know what I mean? It, it gives, it's, you start to build a, a language, you, you know what I mean? It's what continues to build on that so like you can continue to like kind of think how do I continue to fill out these photographs? It's and then I, that's what, and thinking about my neighborhood and what was happening, I'm like, okay, it's a subject matter, but it is also like the buildings and everything going around, thinking about like gentrification and, and things changing over time. And so I kind of started to kind of have like a broader scope to thinking about the images. And like that is just like, yeah, just like trying to build up on that language of like photographic storytelling. I love um, this image, man. Yeah. This was, um, this image is like right off of Broadway, actually. Um, and I, re I would walk by this coffee shop. This is like a new coffee shop in the neighborhood. And it would always look jarring from the outside because this is Gates Avenue. You know, you got that. That's what the, the, the bus stop is outside. And I would always sit outside and you would see, you know, black and Latino people from the neighborhood waiting at the bus stop, just going to school or doing whatever. And you would see like, basically like kind of like a lot of the new affluent white people at the coffee shop all the time and it just looked jarring just visually and I could never really figure out how to make the image because it was like the glare from the outside so then one day I was in the coffee shop getting coffee and I was just sitting there and then these two kids like looked in and you got these other two patrons like sitting there and then I was like boom like there's the image and like sometimes it just kind of made me think about like the things that you kind of think about like what's important to you um when you're thinking about like what you want to photograph it's almost like they like these opportunities or these like photo yeah these photographic opportunities start to present themselves it's almost like I don't know somebody was talking about like the like the the red car challenge or something like if I were to give you like a hundred dollars every time you see a red car like tomorrow you'll see like a whole bunch of red cars and so as, as a photographer it's like what you think about you know what I mean, can like start to appear if if you're like really critical. And it goes back to like what I was saying too, just like it's perception. It's not, you know, it's just perception of like what does it look like. Um, and like that's kind of what photogra photography is, you know, in a way. I think we touched on this a little earlier about, um, I was mentioning like photo stacking, right? Like you, you saw these this cafe, you saw other cafes being built up you know something feels 
weird about it, seeing like the, the black and brown folks waiting for the bus, but then like the white patrons on the inside, you know there's an image there, you don't know exactly what it is, but the more you keep going to this place or staying around this area, that image is gonna like present itself to you. And it's like, I mean, these kids, like I'm thinking like what about this, this shop made these kids interested in going and looking in well and that and that's the thing about photography because it, it lies all the time i mean like they, they got their coats on the scarves they could just just be being kids just looking in windows like that's what kids do they're curious about stuff but in the photograph and that's what i'm saying it's like it just changes things you know and it goes back to that perception like me and you could have been there sitting there having coffee but I'm thinking about something, and you thinking about something completely opposite. And then I could be like, "Yo, you just look at this picture." He's like, and then you be like, "Whoa, you saw that?" And it's like we just looked at the same thing, but our minds are in two different places, you know. And so that's why it goes back to like it's always right now. Like you really got to ground and center yourself to like just be ready to take in the visual world and like understanding just like what's photographic, what's expressive, what like how something looks and like what it might say in an image. Um, I mean, this. I mean, the, these two photos feel pretty timeless to me um, because, you know, it, it almost reminds me of like the civil rights era. You know, um, outside looking in and this boy's expression, like just seeing prices um, of like the food, like uh, the signage, just reminds me of like a lot of the civil rights era images, and. You know these kids are on the outside looking in, the white the white patrons are on the inside looking out, and it just feels like there's this separation between them. Um, so these two images feel really, really, um, you know, um, historical to me. Um, and it's funny, like we know a lot of photographers um, who sort of parachute into like different environments for like a day or two. They, they photograph the environment from the surface and then they dip out, right? Um, and some photographers feel like they need to leave their home and travel to all types of crazy places in order to make images that are meaningful. And while you did move to New York from Omaha, you photographed New York like you've been here forever, man. Like, what is it about, like, this city that you feel a connection to? Yeah, I mean, when I look at this image, as much as I see this boy, I also see myself. It, it reminds me of, like, moving to the city, being broke, being at Crown Fried Chicken. Like, you know what I mean? That's why it's like these, these photographs are really self-portraits. And it's like, you know, coming to New York and, and then starting to, like, make pictures on the streets and... You know, after a, it took me a long time to realize this, but after a while, I, I, you know, I just realized, like, it's like, yes, I'm photographing my neighborhood, my community, this very contemporary life that's happening in front of me, but I also started to realize, like, I'm photographing a lot of, like, my own just, like, baggage and trauma and life experiences, or at least trying to express what some of these things have, like, meant to me, you know, and I think... That's just like the beauty of of art, you know what I mean? Is that you can kind of like do you can deal with like all of these things that make you feel a certain type of way and, and like kind of like wrestle with it and get it out. And and I think that's what I realized like the the city started to become for me. And like that's what a, a lot of some of this work was. You know, I was thinking about I really wanted to make a body of work that expressed how I experienced the city, which is like being in my neighborhood, hopping on the train, going into Manhattan, and coming back to Brooklyn. And like Brooklyn felt like the crib. It felt like Omaha, you know what I mean? And then getting on the train is like this middle passage. It's like this influx of like traveling to somewhere. I've done that a lot in my life. And getting to Manhattan also feels like you know, moments that I, that I, like, it feel, almost feels like being back in Iowa. It feels like, you know, I don't know, kind of feeling like other, feeling like a, this sense of aloneness. You know, I'm being in, I remember being in college and just feeling, you know, just like so alone, being one of the few black people in my universities in the town. Like the town tried to have like KKK rallies, you know what I mean? I, I started to just realize like I had all these real life experiences that have left such impressions on me. And then, like, I can also, like, 
kind of deal with that through street photography and like I just think that's like incredible because like I never would have like imagined like something kind of coming together like that um but like yeah like I said like it goes back to 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 what art is and like what's beautiful about it is is that it's just it can be so layered um and I think yeah that you know, I think just starting to realize that it also just like it kind of helps give you clarity of vision on like what you are doing. And I think that's the beauty of like working on something like long term, giving yourself time for the work to speak to you as well as the, as the maker. Because sometimes it just takes a little bit of time to understand what it is that you're photographing, you know, underneath what the easy thing that might be able to say, you know. And like I like uh, yeah, it just kind of took time for me to realize like some of these like undertoes and like I'm like no wonder my perception is the way it is is because it's like I, like it's a real life like human feeling that I've been through that I connect to that I feel you know. So how how much of your work is inspired by like some sort of like therapy or or healing? I mean, I I think it's all like in a way it's a spiritual practice, you know. I think, um, I mean, photographers are kind of (laughs) nutty. Like we're weird. Like you know, I don't know. There's so much like psychology going on in the background of like, uh, you know. I think any artist and like what these other like what these underlying kind of messages or ethos is like below the work, and so. I think it'll be really hard for me to go out into the world and like make these kind of photographs that I'm making if there wasn't some like deeper connection to what it is that I see or, or I'm trying to say. Um, but then again, like I said, like this is all stuff that's like kind of come to me later. Like even five years ago, I didn't understand some of the things that were going on. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. So here, you know, we're, we're introduced to Cedric again, right, on the left. Um, so I'm going to cycle through a few of these images so you, you see who this young man is and that Andre's been following for a while. This is a younger version of Cedric. And this is an older version of Cedric. Yeah, like those two images are like 10 years apart. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, this young photograph of him is just like, it's almost just so raw. You know, he's he's just like... He's just there. He's not covered up. He's not self-conscious, you know. And then this other photograph of him as a teenager where it's like, yeah, it's cold outside, but he's got the earbuds in. And, you know, it just it, it feels like, you know, there's just like he's he's more aware now. There's something different, that tint like that. I don't know. There's something there that's just like sh- shifted in him, you know. So making these two images, what did you notice differently about how – um, you interacted with them? Well, I think, I mean, this image we made, because I was like, Cedric, I, I want to, I got a picture of you here. I want to, let's recreate this photograph. But like, this picture just happened. Like, we just happened to be on the block one day and he probably was chilling and I just started making pictures here. And so, you know, that, I guess, like, yeah, I think the second picture, I just, I, it was actually like right before the pandemic, but I saw him and a bunch of friends just like, walking down the street after school and then we were just like hanging out and, and recreated this photo. And how old was Cedric here in this photo? He's probably like eight here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's interesting. Like how do you... Nine maybe? Um, yeah, I have a nine-year-old son so uh, this picture speaks to me. Um, but like what what inspired you to like connect with this young this young man and and to like start like hanging out with him like a homie i mean i think i just seen a lot of myself in him just like this young black boy in brooklyn like i don't know he's kind of like the ringleader of all the kids in the neighborhood he just he loved to be photographed he was always outside and we just kind of had like this natural attraction i ended up meeting like his mom and his family and um you know He's still a part of my life today. Like I'm, I'm going to meet up with him tomorrow. His mom's like getting married at the courthouse, so you know things have like shifted. Where it used to be, like I would just catch him on the street 
you know, after school, before school, on the weekends, to now, like, he lives in Flatbush, you know, I live in Best Eye, and, like, now I just, like, our relationship is different, and, like, the way I photograph him is, like, shifting in different kind of ways, you know? So, he, what, he's in his early 20s now? He is 18, he's in his senior year of high school right now. Wow. Yeah. And you're part of the family, it sounds like. Basically. That's really yeah. dope, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is him um, at the barber shop. Nice. So, um, I'm on to pivot um, back into just some some more general questions. Um, so, I know that you are um, uh, 2022, right? 2022, Gordon Parks fellow. Um, you know, Gordon Parks is not only one of the greatest black photographers but greatest photographers right you don't have to even put the black in front of it like this man was super talented in so many different ways um as a photographer as a composer as a writer he's in several books um he wrote shaft and directed shaft um this dude was super talented um what does it mean for you to be a fellow and to have your work like hanging up in the foundation i mean First of all, it's like it's an honor, you know, and like I was saying, it's it's like a full circle moment to be reading about Gordon Parks for the first time, you know, the first year I moved to New York and then like 10 years later to be awarded a fellow um, and to like have like my first real major solo exhibition in the gallery, like it just makes you feel like that you're right where you need to be, that you just need to kind of stay the course. Um yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so I know that um, Gordon Parks was one of the first photographers who um, you started to study and you read his book, but um, who else was an inspiration for you when you were getting started out? Yeah, I mean, Roy DeGarava, like I'm saying, um, Gary Winogrand, huge inspiration for me just because I think his photographs really deal with like the physicality of like the city and uh, you know and that helped me just kind of I think like as an athlete to kind of like get some of that in my work um and then I mean just tons of photography I mean all of Kamongi workshop you know just tons of black street photographer Ming Smith Buford um uh ah what's his name um Adrian Cowens Adrian Cowens Alan um what's his name Alan um I'm drawing a blank, but he has a, a book called Double Up. It's um it's these boxing photographs that I really love. Um I mean tons of photographers, Carrie Mae Weems, um, I don't know. Just like anything, just like kind of just like the the, the classic. I mean, you named a bunch of legends, so I, mean, I think that's a, a great place. The list goes on. This uh, photography has been blessed by so many people's eye, you know. I don't know. There's, there's just so much great work that's out there. So I, I think we're starting to slowly wrap up into a Q&A, but there are two more questions I want to ask. Um, first question is, uh, being that you're a, a, a fellow, um, if you could be in conversation with Gordon Parks, what would be one of the first questions you would ask him? Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's hard because I feel like in a way he just gave us so much with the work alone, you know? Um, I would probably just want to just like sit in his presence and just like be around his aura. Like <laughs> the brother was smooth, he talks smooth, he dressed smooth. But I don't know, I would probably ask him, you know, what was it that just like inspired him to keep going? Because like in the time when he was making work, like the the country was in a very different place and things were hard and it was ugly and it was racist. And, you know, for him to break through, I would just ask him like, you know, what what just kind of gave him you know, his inspiration and, and willpower, you know. Um, but at the same time, it's like, like you said, like, I don't know. He's given us so much. Like, I remember one time I had a I had a chance to meet Robert Frank. And, like, it was like, it's almost like the question you're asking me now. And it's like, what do you ask them? Like, 
you know, you just sit in their presence. Like, I don't know. I'm kind of weird. It's like sometimes people just give so much in their work. It's like, I don't even know what you would say. <laughs> I, I respect that. I respect that. And um, so the last question is, uh, if you had to choose, right, would you go on a photo walk with Golden Parks, be photographed by him, or photograph him? <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what? I would I would probably I would probably go on a photo walk with him. Um there's incredible he was beautiful. Anybody can make a photograph of Gordon Parks, it's gonna be good. He's just like a beautiful man, you know what I mean? And like I don't need to be photographed by him. I feel like if I were to go on a walk with him, like maybe there would just be something in his practice and his walk and the way that he talked to people that I might be able to kind of like adopt for myself. So I think that would be something that like, and like just to be able to like, I don't know, yeah, just like enjoy the space like that. And like, I, as a street photographer, I've walked the city, the streets with other photographers and it's this... You know, as much as you do have to kind of like work alone and, and just kind of get to it by yourself, there is something beautiful, like being out in the world and like kind of and for photographing and like ex like having this energy that you're bouncing off of with people and like I don't know, just something about the camaraderie and that and just things that you can learn from other people. That's that's always just like I've always like enjoyed that from time to time too. So I, the photo walk is what I would choose. Yeah, I would have to agree with that, I think, because I'd probably be able to snap some photos of him <laughs> and probably get some snaps from him as well, right? So, cool, cool. So, I think that we're going to open the floor up for Q&A. Um, but, yo, um, before we do that, is there anything um, that you want to share, that um, the questions that I didn't ask that you want to share any information about? No, nah, I just thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you, man. This was dope. This was dope. So, um, all right. How um, I'm gonna open up the floor for Q and A. But um, does anybody have any questions for Andre? All right. Hold on one second. Oh wait. So we're, I think we'll get a microphone up to you. Hey, how you doing, Andre? My name is Cavion. I am a uh, thirty-five millimeter film photographer. Uh, I have a story of my, my own of how I got into it. But for you, my question is for the, for your work that you submitted to, um, to uh, the New York Times, was it still in this category of street photography or was there something more specific that you had exclusively for them that you submitted? I think what I submitted was like mostly like my street photography work. But when I got in, because I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how it is now, but it used to be you could meet with people from the Times or like other magazines, but then there was also like um, gallerists or curators that you could meet with as well. And so I remember, I think I met with like a, a few um, editors from magazines and like a couple gallerists. And like, I think when I came in with my actual portfolio, I had like a variety of work and it was like my street photography, some portrait work, and I kind of like showed whatever made sense based on the person that I was meeting. Thank you. We have a question up here. A microphone. Okay. Hey, it's kind of a continuation on this question. When you submitted to the portfolio review, were you doing that independently or were you potentially already working with a mentor. And so in addition to that, now that you're in this practice, have you become a mentor? Do you have mentees? So yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely was just, it was just me applying just by myself. I didn't really have any mentors, but yeah, I do mentor people. I, I give advice. I try to share. I do a lot of like visiting um, like schools and like crits. Um, so yeah, I, I try to, you know, share what I have for sure. Thank you. So, uh, my question is, you said before that you go out and you might have mantras or things that are in the back of your mind as you're going, right? 
a lot of your photos that I'm seeing, I went up, I saw your, uh, your gallery in the Gord Parks Foundation. A lot of your photographs involve youth. Is that intentional? Is it because of a specific reason? Are they, like how you said, how Cedric, once he got older, maybe he's a little bit more guarded in the way he perceives himself, or he's a little bit more cognizant of how he acts. Do you feel like maybe kids are more expressive or honest with the way they behave? Yeah, I think um, a lot of that just kind of started because, like, that's, there was just, like, a lot of kids just, like, on my block, and I always loved, like, those New York photographs of, like, kids, like, playing on the street and stuff like that. Um, I think this just kind of kind of happens to be the edit of, of photographs, but I think my photographs do cover, like, a, a wide range of, like, young and old, and so I think, but there is, like, definitely, I have, like, a, a good chunk and section of, like, youth, and I, I, I don't know, I think just I like what it represents. I think there's, maybe I see some of my own, like, kind of childhood in that as well, um, and I, I think kids are really kind of expressive and unguarded in that kind of way, but, um, yeah. We have another back here. Hi, can you guys hear me? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, I, my question was kind of similar. Um, I noticed that you had a lot of black men and boys and I was wondering um, if that's like a conscious choice or like w how do you sort of like, um, like what kind of gaze do you employ when you're working, not that like you think about it, con if you do think about it consciously, but I do notice that you have covered quite a lot of black boyhood. So I was uh, wondering if that was a conscious choice or not. I think it's just like a natural kind of gravitation of, you know, I just, this was who I connect with maybe. And so I think it's maybe that's like a, a, a entry way for me and what feels like true. And again, I think kind of maybe just looking back at some of my own, like, I feel like I see a lot of my childhood in like the photographs of the youth that I do photograph. Um, and so I think it's just like, yeah, I think it's just, just what feels like I connect to personally. And just to um, piggyback off of that, um, the images that are being shown now are images that I selected. So there's, there's some editing as far as the selection process goes, but Andre does have like a, a much larger body of work that is more diverse. Thank you have you one so more much. question back here. Sure, yeah. Hello. Um, I guess my question is more so about like the titling of your works. Like in lots of them, like you seem to be focusing on like other people's lives and how you fit into them, like especially in your community. So I guess when you're representing your work to other people, um, like how do you balance the, like the way you like perceive your subjects, but also making sure that you represent them to the best of your abilities when titling your works and representing it to like in galleries or um, in your photo book. I think it's like City Blues or something like that. I think that's what it's called. I'm not really sure, but if I did my homework correctly, I think that's just something along those lines. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, like with my titles, I, you know, I'm I'm really kind of particular like and just understanding like the importance of like you know archiving properly and so like my titles usually just represent like the neighborhoods um and the years that you know that I've made those pictures so that they can be like kind of traced back to like the the neighborhood or whatever but like I don't unless it's like like mostly for like the street photographs, it's just like neighborhood and and the and the year and like that's kind of how I title it. It's ba basically everything's like untitled, um, just like location based. Um, I got a question. Up. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all your work. Um, it's really incredible, and you can just see how much you connect with your community here. Um, I'm curious if you've gone back to Omaha and taken extensive amounts of work there, or if you haven't, do you have an urge to go back there and take more? Um, yeah, curious how that feels to you. Yeah, I haven't. I have been back to Omaha to photograph a little bit, and like that is something that I do want to do. We were just talking about that. 
before we started. There's this uh there's a body of work by Gordon Parks called uh, Back to Fort Scott. And that's like him going back to where he was from. And I always said I want to do like back to Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> so I I do want to go back and, and make work. Um, I just just got to see like when that's going to happen. Is there something off the top of your head you would want to take a photo of there or like a community or an area? Or a... I mean, I think I'd definitely go back to like North Omaha, like where I'm from and kind of like retrace steps. I still know a ton of people in Omaha. So maybe like you know, digging into, like, some friends, like, lives and stuff like that. But, like, I don't know. I think I would be kind of open. Like, I've also just, like, I've shifted so much as a person, and I'll be kind of curious to see, like, what I gravitate to. And talk about a full circle moment, right? Yeah. yeah. We have a one more question right here. Um, I got a question real quick. Um, If you had to describe, if you could, if you could... What would be three words you would describe your work? If you had to describe your work in three words, what would it be? Three terms. Challenge. <laughs> um, I would just say, I mean, dang, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, black is beautiful. Like, I don't know. Um, what's going on, Andre? It's a pleasure to just hear you speak about your work. Um, so I'm a photographer based out of the Bronx. And for me, um, I find it a little bit difficult to document my community just because I understand how crazy it is to just walk around with a camera. Because yeah. I will look at somebody crazy if they come around my hood with a camera too. But um, with that said, I will ask, what are the challenges you have faced? Or like, what have what photographs have you found difficult to make? in your environment, whether it's just you walking around or you being in a, doing an assignment? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, there's definitely like certain people in my neighborhood who didn't want to be photographed, but they were like cool with me and like me doing what I do, you know, where I lived on, on Gates Avenue is like around plenty of projects, you know, and there's like a lot of activity going on. And so, um, that is like a challenge in terms of just like walking around with a camera, you know, understanding like your presence and like how people are like are perceiving you. And I think, you know, kind of just like, you know, being open and, and about what you're doing and also just trying to be curious, asking questions, pulling up to people and just seeing like if you can, you know, photograph them or be around or like sometimes like I would be like on a certain block and it's just like you just got to make like one connection with somebody and then that kind of like gives you like a little bit more freedom or at least it gives you somebody that you're tethered to to be like hey he's with me like it's all good and um, that's kind of how I use a lot of the street vendors you know it's like if I knew them and I'm with them and like they kind of knew everybody on the block so that kind of gave me like a little bit of pass um but it, it it just all depends. It's like you are going to know best. It's like you're from the Bronx. You, you know, it's, it's your neighborhood. You you understand, like, which, what what is acceptable and what's not in terms of, like, photography. And I think it's just, like, trying to figure out, like, what, like, personally, like, what is your why and, like, and what, what you want to photograph and, and trying to figure out how you can, like, go about that. But... It's like every situation is gonna be different. Just like you know, like every neighborhood kind of got their own thing going on. So, but that that's like a real thing. And like, um, also I think uh, it, there's nothing like photo like living in a place and photographing it. Like I've since moved from my old neighborhood, and like even my connection and everything to it is just like has shifted because like I'm not that's not where I don't just wake up and like I'm there all the time you know but I think like also just like the longevity of being in a place and like uh, knowing people over time and like even like some of these kids like now live in certain projects and stuff and like now I'm like I'm in there with them because like I've been photographing them since they were yay high and so it it just all it all depends on everybody's like kind of circumstances and like how you connect to the place and like how you can find like an anchor somehow. 
All right, y'all. So I think that is a wrap for Late Night ICP with Black Shutter and Andre Wagner. Thank you all for coming through and showing up. Again, my name is Idris Talib Solomon. You can find Black Shutter on Instagram at BLK Shutter and online BLKShutter.com. Thank you again and tune in for more events coming up. And on that note, I pass the mic back to the ICP folks. Thank you.